Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Great. Thanks, Brian. And it's really my pleasure to be here today. I learn a lot from the members of the HIV ECHO panel and I'm constantly asking them questions. We'll get through some disclosure slides. I also wanted to put a shout out to TB Echo. And so I'm part of the faculty for TB Echo. That happens every week, Tuesday, or most weeks, uh, Tuesdays, 1230 to 1.30 Pacific time. And the link there is there. And uh, you're welcome to join. You sign up and register. And we would love to hear about your challenging or even not so challenging situations that you're dealing with for treating latent TB infection, TB disease, screening, etc. So please join us. Great. So today, the outline and goals for today, my first goal is to make sure that everyone is aware of the OI guidelines and pregnancy considerations and, and where to find them. Then we'll do a review of a few key infections with specific pregnancy considerations, including TB, which is an ancient humbling disease. However, we have new short course regimens for both latent TB, infection and TB disease treatment. However, they're not routinely recommended in pregnancy due to a lack of data, which is gonna be uh, a theme that you'll hear throughout the, the next couple of minutes. And then syphilis, additionally an ancient disease that's important, I think, to keep on talking about due to the alarming increases in infections during pregnancy and congenital syphilis. The treatment of choice is still the same as it's always been, which is penicillin, and this is even in the setting of recent shortages, which it seems are doing better now. Given the time, I don't think we'll, we'll get to MPOX, but we'll see. Maybe that'll be for next time. Just to get us on the same page, there's a number of absolutely normal immunologic and physiologic changes that are associated with pregnancy. However, these immunologic changes in pregnancy may potentially increase incidence of some infections. And you can see here specifically malaria, listeria, and even importantly to this group, HIV. It can also increase severity of some infections, including influenza, hepatitis E, and HSV, et cetera. Additionally, there's a number of normally occurring physiologic changes in pregnancy, but you can imagine they may affect the dosing and frequency of medications as well as potentially the severity of adverse effects to medications that we use to either prevent or treat opportunistic infections. Additionally, the signs and symptoms of some opportunistic infections also may be masked by common symptoms of an absolutely normal pregnancy. You can imagine this has implications for opportunistic infection prevention as well as treatment. And then lastly, this is all complicated by frequently there's a lack of data regarding drugs in pregnancy, Pregnant persons are generally excluded from the clinical trials that we use to make decisions, our best practices for treatment and prevention. And lastly, when we do have animal study data, it often doesn't correlate one-to-one -one with human findings. It really matters what model's being used, what disease process, what drugs, et cetera. And so I'll start with our first question today. And so my question to this audience is, have you used the HHS OI guideline recommendations specifically for prevention or treatment in pregnant people with HIV? And so I'm curious, what's your all's experience in, in using this resource? Great, I love it. It's like a triple split, perfect. So hopefully the folks who are very comfortable using the guidelines, you can teach me on what you like uh, about those guidelines. The folks who haven't, I'm gonna show you how to access it. And for those of you who are quite honest, which I love it, transparency is key for learning, this is how you access it as well. So you'll go to the OI guidelines, which I'm thinking many people on the, this panel are very used to using. So you'll go to the OI guidelines and you'll notice, for example, my interest and passion is in tuberculosis. So you'll get to, for example, the mycobacterium tuberculosis chapter here, and there's the link. And then in most of these chapters, there'll be key boxes where there's important information that can be easily found with regards to either if diagnosis is different in pregnancy, treatment, or prevention. It really is trying to distill down any important features that would be important if you're thinking about these infections in somebody who's pregnant, breast or chest feeding, et cetera. And I show two examples here for uh, TB and MPOX. 
So the first topic is one that's near and dear to my heart. So we're first starting to discuss latent TB infection screening and treatment, uh, as well as TB uh, treatment for pregnant people living with HIV. To get us warmed up, which of the following is false? So I'm looking for a wrong answer here. So which of the following is false regarding TB and pregnant people living with HIV? A, isoniazid is given typically for six or nine months, often called 6H or 9H. And that's recommended as a first line treatment for a latent TB infection in pregnant people with HIV. B, if pyrazinamide, one of the drugs that we use for drug-susceptible TB, if that's not included in the regimen with isoniazid, rifampin, and ethambutol, then we have to extend our treatment course from six months to nine months. Or C, our new shorter course regimens to prevent TB disease, that is to treat latent TB infection, including three months of weekly isoniazid and rifampicin, often called 3-HP, or one month of daily isoniazid and rifampicin, often called 1-HP, are currently recommended for pregnant people with HIV due to their improved tolerability, adherence, and shorter course. Which one of these is false? Great, I think we could probably go ahead and close the poll and let's see. I love it, again, a triple split. So it looks like there was a, almost an even split between these answers and that's fantastic and that's why I'm here to talk with us today. And so the answer, the false answer, is actually C. So for the first one, it's still recommended currently for first line for pregnant people with HIV when we're treating latent TB infection, we still give isoniazid. So A is true. B, if pyrazinamide is not included for drug susceptible TB, we typically have to extend our treatment regimen out. Instead of six months, we're now treating for nine months for active TB disease. So that's also true. Unfortunately, C is the false one. So although we'll hear about new shortened regimens for both latent TB as well as TB disease, but neither are currently recommended for pregnant people living with HIV, basically due to a lack of data. And so you'll hear that theme. Often our recommendations are based on the fact that we lack data. Just as a little aside, a little teaser, I, I really do love, love this article, but one of the oldest examples of TB was actually confirmed in the bones of a Neolithic woman and their infants. So TB is an ancient disease, and I think that thinking uh, questions regarding TB, pregnancy, and, and children are important ones and can provide us important information. So what is the global burden of TB? Well, as many of you know, there's each year there's about 10 million new cases diagnosed globally of active TB disease. And about 33% occur among women, and the majority are occurring during ages that we often typically associate with pregnancy potential. So that's about 33%. But we don't really have great estimates of TB and pregnancy. Our closest modeling estimates are about 200,000 TB diagnoses that are occurring during uh, pregnancy each year. But the burden is probably higher than that, and it's probably likely underreported because most of our routine data collecting uh, programs that we use for TB don't actually even have a checkbox for pregnancy. So if you can't collect the data, you can't record the data, we don't have the data. Turning now to talk a little bit about the spectrum of TB disease from latent TB infection to TB disease, when we're thinking of TB, there's really this spectrum from where we really think that about 25% of the global population, and this is in general, is thought to have latent TB infection. And this definition, I like this, this is from the WHO. It's a little complicated, but I think it really gets to the crux of the matter. It's the state of having persistent immune responses to mycobacterium tuberculosis, but people remain, importantly, asymptomatic and they're not infectious. And people with latent TB infection may benefit from latent TB treatment to prevent progression from infection to active TB disease. In contrast, people with active TB disease often have symptoms such as cough, fever, weight loss. This is a state of infectiousness. And the diagnosis is often confirmed with collecting respiratory samples, including sputum for smear culture and molecular tests. When we're thinking about HIV, HIV increases the risk of progressing from this asymptomatic, uninfectious state of latent TB over to the right to active TB disease. 
However, we have lots of tools at hand, including both ART and TB preventative therapy, which is another term that we use for latent TB infection treatment that can help reduce that risk and get you further to the left of that spectrum. So our whole goal of diagnosing latent TB infection, that asymptomatic state when people aren't infectious, is really to identify persons who are most likely to benefit from treatment to prevent that shift to active TB disease. Many of you are familiar and very comfortable with the diagnostics that we use for latent TB, and they're the same for both people with and without HIV. We use the tuberculin skin test as well as the um, blood-based interferon gamma uh, release assays. Pregnancy itself is not an indication for screening, though antenatal care in many settings may provide the opportunity to do so. And this is a question not for a poll, but in the chat. I'm curious that in the setting that you work in, are pregnant people with HIV, are they routinely screened during pregnancy uh, for latent TB infection? So feel free to put that in the chat because I'm always curious. Uh, there's different practice variations. One of the questions with latent TB infection or prevention of TB during pregnancy is the, is the timing. When should we treat? So in high burden settings, the WHO recommends that people with HIV of either an unknown or positive, having either an unknown or a positive TB infection test, that tuberculin skin test or that interferon gamma release assay, in high burden settings, the idea is to treat now, regardless of whether or not they've had a known recent TB exposure or a recent TB infection test conversion. In contrast, in low burden settings, such as the US, there really is a split between folks who are at higher risk versus those who are at lower risk. And so for folks who are pregnant living with HIV, the idea is for people who are at higher risk, so they've had a recent test conversion, or a recent known contact with somebody with active uh, TB disease, the idea is to treat now, to treat latent TB infection now, even if it's in the first trimester, because that risk of going on um, to developing active TB disease is so high within that first year of exposure. For people who are at lower risk, the idea is that you could potentially consider waiting until after delivery or two to three months postpartum really trying to avoid the timing of highest risk of hepatotoxicity with some of the drugs that we use, including isoniazid. But again, this really is a provider-patient conversation, and we're really trying to balance the benefits and risks, including the opportunity to treat latent TB infection while somebody is engaged in the healthcare system, the timing, what is the, of the exposure, the risk of going on to developing active TB disease, and also the risks of, of side effects. So this really is a this needs to be a nuanced conversation with the person in front of you. I mentioned a little bit earlier that more recently, although TB is an ancient disease, we have new tools at hand, including these shorter course uh, regimens for TB prevention or treatment of latent TB infection, using a combination of rifapentine and isoniazid, even either given weekly for three months called 3-HP or given daily for one month called 1-HP, and both of these regimens have been associated with increased completion rates, as well as lower rates of discontinuation. So that's exciting news. However, and there's data specifically from trials that enrolled people living with HIV. However, unfortunately, in these trials of these short course regimens, pregnant and postpartum people were uh, excluded. Additionally, we have shorter course regimens for TB treatment, including uh, people living with HIV. And this includes a four month regimen that now includes rifapentine and moxifloxacin for tuberculosis. And they found that this four month regimen with rifapentine and moxifloxacin was found to be non-inferior in efficacy with similar safety to our routine standard of care six months of isoniazid rifampin, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. And based on this data, based on data from this trial, both the CDC and the WHO recommend that this new four-month regimen as an option for adults and adolescents with drug-sensitive pulmonary TB, including people living with HIV who are non-pregnant with CD4 counts greater than 100. Currently, if they're on a Favrins-based ART due to some questions about drug-drug interactions and, and data on more contemporary regimens, dilutegravir are coming. But again, 
pregnant and postpartum people were excluded from these trials, although pregnancy happens routinely during trials. And so there is some safety data that's unpublished, but hopefully will be published soon about people who had an incident pregnancy during this trial and potentially had exposure to one of the trial arms. So now let's focus on what are the current recommendations for latent TB infection and TB treatment in pregnant uh, women with HIV. For latent TB infection, the preferred treatment still remains a six or nine months of isoniazid. Alternatively, rifampin can be used, and many people prefer rifampin due to a reduced risk of hepatotoxicity that you can see in late pregnancy, early postpartum. However, we have to think about drug-drug in interactions with rifampin and many of the medications that we use to treat HIV. Additionally, 3-HR, this is used more commonly in Europe, but three months of daily isoniazid and rifampin can be used. And then for TB uh, disease treatment, we've talked about even though there's newer short course regimens available, currently um, for people who are pregnant with HIV, the recommendation is to still use our six-month therapy. If in the U.S., sometimes we recommend not using pyrazinamide basically because there's a lack of data, although pyrazinamide is used routinely in the rest of the world and is a WHO recommendation. But if pyrazinamide is not included, now we have to extend our regimens from six months to nine months. Because of the data and rifapentine is limited, neither the, those short course regimens for TB infection treatment or TB disease treatment are not currently recommended. I'm going to go ahead and switch gears a little bit to syphilis. So to wake us up again, I've got uh, another question here. So again, which of the following is false regarding screening and treatment for syphilis in pregnancy? So that all pregnant people should be screened at their first prenatal encounter with repeat screening at 28 weeks. Is that false? Any pregnant person who's not been screened in pregnancy or who has a stillborn birth greater than 20 weeks of gestation, they should be screened at delivery. C, any pregnant person who gives birth to a stillborn after 20 weeks of gestation should be screened at delivery. Oops, there's a little bit of repeat here. Or D, in the setting of the penicillin uh, shortage or due to allergy, doxycycline is recommended to treat syphilis in pregnancy. So which of these is false? We've got questions about timing of screening, and we've got a question about whether or not we can, it's routinely recommended to use doxycycline in pregnancy, either due to the penicillin shortage or due to allergy. Which of these looks false? Great. So a little less of the triple split this time, and I agree with you. A, B, and C are true, but D is false. So currently, doxycycline is, is not currently recommended in pregnancy for the indication of syphilis. I know there's been other speakers who have talked about the resurgence of the syphilis epidemic in the U.S., but I think these numbers are astounding, and so I think it's important for us to remind ourselves. So the maternal and congenital syphilis rates are significantly increasing in the U.S. Syphilis amongst pregnant people giving birth in the U.S. has more than tripled over the last 10 years or so. And then in terms of congenital syphilis, I put this is a ridiculous number, over a 755% increase in U.S. Uh, congenital syphilis cases in the U.S. of the about the last 10 years. In doing a deeper dive on why this is happening, it appears that there's a number of missed opportunities that are contributing to this increased rates, including a, a lack of prenatal care and timely testing, as well as probably even more concerning is a lack of treatment despite a timely diagnosis. So what are the indications for syphilis screening in pregnant people with HIV? They're really the same whether or not a person has HIV or not. And so the take home is that all pregnant people, including pregnant people with HIV, should be routinely screened for syphilis. So it's all pregnant people screened at the first prenatal encounter with repeat screening at 28 weeks. This is the national recommendation about pregnant people at high risk for infection who've not been screened in pregnancy to screen at delivery, although I'm aware that in, in many settings, uh, folks are being rescreened again at delivery. And for people who give birth, who deliver a uh, stillborn after 20 weeks of gestation. So I'm curious in the chat, are people routinely being screened at delivery in your setting, or is it more at the first prenatal encounter and repeat screening at 28 weeks and our people are only being uh, screened at delivery if they're considered to be high risk. 
So my question for the audience, because I'd love to learn from you all in the chat, please put in the chat if in your setting, people are routinely uh, being screened for syphilis at delivery, even if they've already been screened before. In terms of the preferred treatment for syphilis, like I've said, the answer is still penicillin. So penicillin is the preferred treatment for syphilis in pregnant people, including pregnant people with HIV. And this is even in the case of allergy. So pregnant people, including pregnant people with HIV, should be offered desensitization to pregnancy and, and be treated with uh, penicillin. I won't go through the details here, um, but at every stage of syphilis, the answer is penicillin. It's just a different formulation or how long or how often you have to give it, but the answer is penicillin. And then regarding tetracyclines, because often we're pulling doxycycline out for other people for treatment of syphilis, but tetracyclines, including doxycycline, are not generally recommended in pregnancy. This is especially in the second or third trimester. And that's due to the potential for the depression of fetal bone growth data. And this is data that was really from tetracycline given to from premature infants and was associated with this decreased long uh, bone growth, as well as some data in increased skeletal anomalies in mice but not in rabbits with supra-therapeutic doses. So again, if you remember from that earlier slide, we used lots of different animal models, different animal models show different things, and sometimes it's not one-to-one -to, -one to, to the human data. But doxycycline is not currently recommended in, in pregnant people. And we're wrapping up here soon. I, I put this here because I think it's important for people who, who practice in a number of different settings. But there really is a, not, a very a limited role for non-penicillin regimens to treat syphilis in, in pregnant people with HIV. And, and so this is the WHO regimens, including uh, erythromycin, et cetera. And so neither erythromycin or azithromycin cross the placental barrier efficiently. And so therefore, it's really important that if you're in a setting that's using these drugs for this indication, that newborn infant treatment is required. And then additionally, thinking about data in our own setting, this was a fantastic paper recently published with authors from local investigators that have now shown that there's really a near universal resistance to macrolides, um, syphilis in North America. So not only is it the issues about the drug crossing the placental barrier, but there's issues of resistance, making these not great, good choices for, for treating uh, syphilis in our setting. In terms of follow-up, for syphilis that's diagnosed or treated before 24 weeks gestation, the idea is to repeat those titers eight weeks after treatment and repeat at delivery. Titers can be repeated sooner if there's a concern for reinfection or treatment failure. And then if later on uh, during gestation for syphilis diagnosed and treated after 24 weeks gestation, those titers should also be repeated at delivery. We know titers take time. Uh, that sounds like a great poem, but titers take time to calm down. So most pregnant people will not receive that nice full decrease in titers before delivery because they don't have enough time, although this does not necessarily indicate treatment failure, but it's, an, it's important to track. And so lastly, this is just a summary slide uh, looking at our recommendations regarding tuberculosis and syphilis to see where they're similar in terms of are different. And so for TB, it's really more of a risk-based screening, while syphilis is really more of a universal-based screening. Our treatments for TB are split between whether or not we think it's infection or disease, with a couple of important caveats. If we don't use pyrazinamide for treatment, we have to extend out therapy from six to nine months. In terms of treatment timing for TB infection, if it's a higher risk for going on to progress to TB disease, the idea is to treat now. Whereas if it's a lower risk, you can have that risk-benefit discussion and discuss whether or not it makes sense to wait to that postpartum period. In really high burden settings, that's a different discussion, different calculus, because the risk much, is, is much higher. But with TB disease, do not delay treatment. Even in first trimester, the idea is that you really want to treat active TB disease right when it's diagnosed. Syphilis, our treatment is the same, penicillin. And importantly, when somebody's diagnosed, not to delay treatment. And I think we'll end there. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.